Today I continue in that series titled The Living Sacrifice and today we are focusing on the cost of being a living sacrifice. The cost of being a living sacrifice. Remember we had been focusing on um, Romans, Romans 12 verse 1 where Paul says um, in view of his mercies I beseech you brethren therefore that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God. The, um, a living sacrifice, that you present your bodies, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. This is your, he says, this is your reasonable act of service. This is the, the, the easiest, the cheapest thing you can do in return for what God has done for you to present yourself as a living sacrifice. And last week we dealt with, um, hindrances to being a living sacrifice and I identified seven hindrances amongst many others um, you may identify in your life but I was able to um, cover seven and then namely the fear of people um, loving the praises and honor that come from men personal insecurities that you know the fear of people can be a hindrance to you following God for doing the will of God in your life the um the the love for the praises adulation and honor that comes from men can also be a hindrance to you from following the Lord um, into whatever he has called you to do personal insecurities uh personal insecurities we talked about um Jeremiah's insecurities Moses's insecurities and um, Gideon's insecurities when it comes to oh, them doing the will of God for their lives. These people identified insecurities that were um, posing a hindrance. And we all have in some way, we have hinder, um, personal insecurities that have either hindered us in the past or continue to hinder us. So personal insecurities, you want to watch that hindrance um, in your way to being a living sacrifice or doing the will of God, the comfort and the blessings of life. We talked about how sometimes the even the spouse or the children or the business or career that God has blessed you with can be a hindrance. Even having um, been wealthy, also we looked at, we mentioned the rich young ruler, his wealth was a hindrance to him in following the Lord to receive eternal life. So the comforts and the blessings of life could even be hindrances to us. The cares and the anxieties or worries that we have in this world and we talked about how many people we were so worried about their family members that they could not follow the lord so um we number six i mentioned self-preservation the desire to preserve ourselves not to um make sacrifices not to um be selfless also poses a hindrance and finally i said unbelief lack of faith hardness of heart or unrenewed mind. I lumped all this into one, um, unbelief, lack of faith, hin um, um, hardness of heart and unrenewed mind could pose a hindrance to you um, fulfilling the will of God or being a living sacrifice or following the Lord to wherever, wherever he wants to lead you to. So this week we continue by focusing on the cost. We're going to cover the cost. Um, and I want to anchor it to a scripture in Luke 14, Luke chapter 14, verse 25 to 33. That will be a springboard, my springboard this um, for this message. Luke chapter 14, verse 25 to 33. And it reads, this is um, Jesus. This is now great multitudes went with him, that's Jesus. And he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife, and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Pay attention to these words. Jesus itemizes certain things that could potentially um, obstruct um, our progress in following him, progress in discipleship. He says, if anyone would not hate and when it says hate there, it doesn't mean that you despise them, that you have um, negative emotions towards them. No, it's talking about prioritizing um, these people. That if if um, if anyone comes to me and does not deprioritize his father and mother and wife, these are fire or father and mother, the people that brought you into this world. So God is saying, even they are no exemption. The your wife, the one that you 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 
you gave your love to and said for better or worse god is saying yes but even that comes on comes after me and your children the children that you are responsible for bringing into this world and you're the custodians of their lives you know even those jesus says i come before them he said your brothers and sisters the people that you've known from from birth you know your family really your next of kin your flesh you know that if you do not deprioritize these people before me and even yourself and he adds yourself to it that even your own life if you do not deprioritize your own life um he said you cannot he didn't say you may not he said you cannot that means it is impossible for you to be my disciple and being a disciple is simply being the follower of Jesus Christ. And that is what we are Christians, means we're followers of Christ. So being a disciple um, requires you to deprioritize all relationships, all affiliations, all um, human connections or um, acquisitions or possessions um, to deprioritize them and put him first. So he proceeds to say, verse 28, he said, for which of you, or oh, verse 27, I beg your pardon, he says, and whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, count the cost. Remember today, we're talking about the cost of being a living sacrifice. So Jesus is bringing the cost factor into discipleship. He said, verse 28, for which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it, lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish, verse 31. Or, he uses another illustration, what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. Verse 33, it is so likewise, that is in the same manner, whoever of you does not forsake all, whoever of you does not forsake all, that's Jesus is saying that the least above is not even exhaustive. It says the list of the relationships that I listed above by own by no means is it an exhaustive list. Do not be mistaken. It says whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Cannot, 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 cannot. He's saying it is impossible for us to be disciples unless we forsake, we let go of. We're going to go deeper into what that means, uh, that we let go of these things, these relationships, these um, possessions, these things that we have. If we do not learn to forsake them, we cannot be his disciple. And I ask you, what is the purpose of Christianity if you cannot be a disciple of Jesus Christ? then what are you calling Christianity? What is Christianity about if we cannot be disciples of Jesus Christ? Now, I want us to delve deeper. If you look at Luke 14, the contemporary, contemporary English version puts verse 25 to 27 this way, just so you can understand what Jesus is saying. He says, you cannot be my disciple unless you love me more unless you love me you know the previous verse says hate your father and all that but this is saying unless you love me more than you love your father and more than you love your mother that more than you love your wife more than you love your children more than you love your brothers and sisters you cannot follow me unless you love me more than you love your own life <laughs> i don't know about you but for me this is humanly impossible this is not something we can do in our strength. How can, how can someone be asking you to love him more than the people that gave birth to you, than the people that sustained you, fed you, sent you to school, housed you, and the people you call family? How? 
He says, you cannot unless you love me more unless you love me more, even love me more than your family and your own life. Um, the amplified version, it says, whoever does not carry his own cross, that's verse 27. It says, expressing a willingness to endure whatever may come and follow after me, believing in me, conforming to my example in living and if need be suffering or perhaps dying because of faith in me cannot be my disciple oh gosh this almost makes it sound worse expressing a willingness that you have to carry your cross and what does it mean to carry your cross carrying your cross simply the cross represents death a place of death Remember, we're talking about being a living sacrifice. So it's telling you, being that person who carries a cross daily. So today I'm carrying my cross. And then whenever an instance show up or, or something shows up that is requiring me, that is opposed to me going after the Lord, I what do I do? I take that thing, whatever it is, that relationship, that material thing, that thought, that belief, that attitude, whatever it is, I take it and nail it to the cross and crucify it. That is a picture of being a living sacrifice. It's not something we do at the beginning of our salvation. It's not something we do um, just at some phase in Christian work. It's something we do daily. So he's saying here that um, to carry our cross means to express that willingness to endure whatever may come, even loss, and, and follow after me, believing in me, conforming to my example in living and in, if need be, suffering. There's this song we are fond of singing. Me, I know go suffer. I know go beg for bread. Yes, we will not suffer. We will not beg for bread. Amen. However, there's some, there's some um, type of suffering that we have been called to in Christ. And that's, I believe Peter speaks of that. That's not my point of deliberation this morning. But what we're, what we're, we're going to, the cost also kinds of, um, kind of, sort of relates a bit to some sort of suffering. I mean, when you have to give up um, um, your relationships, give up material possessions, it's, your flesh is suffering, isn't it? So it's saying here, suffering or perhaps dying because of faith in me cannot be my, my disciple. Lastly, if we look at um, Luke 14 in the message version, it says, anyone who comes to me but refuses to let go of father, mother, spouse, children, brothers, sisters, yes, even one's own life, refuses to let go, said, you cannot be my disciple. Can't be my disciple. Anyone who won't shoulder his own cross and follow behind me cannot be my disciple can't be my disciple. Simply put, I love this verse 33, pay attention. Simply put, if you're not willing to take what is dearest to you, if you're not willing to take what is dearest to you, whether plans or people, and kiss it goodbye, kiss it goodbye, you can't be my disciple. Oh, this use, uses uh, another phrase just to, to expand our understanding of, of what Jesus is saying. He's saying that if you're not willing to take what is dearest to you, question, what is dearest to you? Ask yourself. There are many questions you're going to be asking yourself as this message pro progresses. What is dearest to you? I was speaking to someone, um, was it last week? One of, um, I would say one of my students and she she read i recommended a book for her and she read it and you know the the appointment in jerusalem by lydia prince and she said she read it she was like oh my god she can't believe somebody lived sacrificed so much for the lord and lived their life like that she said she began to ask herself that lord are you asking me to go to jerusalem like this woman are you you know are you asking me she was just asking herself different questions at some point she said no way she said there is no way i'm going i just laughed i thought wow <laughs> And that's obviously, that's where she was. And it just made me laugh because that's where, you know, you, you every now and again, you hear Christians say that. Even yesterday, I still heard some single people saying things like they can never marry a man who earns less than them or half their income. They were so they were saying, no way, no way. At what age? Any 25K or something, God forbid. I'm like, okay. 
if what if the lord and i was we're trying to make them understand that at the time that god said to me who my husband was he at that time it wasn't working for a number of years so that was me having to carry my cross and say lord if this is your will so be it obviously i won't advise anybody to marry somebody who's not working naturally speaking however should the lord that's the caveat should the lord require it why not? They, they were also saying yesterday about marrying somebody at um, much younger than them. And I was letting them know that that Lydia Prince married a man um, 25 years younger than her. And they were shocked. Why? Because the Lord said, that is your husband. That is, he said to the 25 year old man or however old he was at the time and said, that is your wife. This woman who is 25 years older than you is the wife I have chosen for you question single people in the house single men can you marry a woman 25 years older than you because the lord says so if the lord says so that is what i mean by being a living sacrifice praise the lord so simply put if you are not willing to take what is dearest to you whether plans or people and kiss it goodbye you can't be my disciple, says the Lord. Right. So what exactly, what's the point of Luke 14? What's the point of Luke 14? Luke 14 is saying, it's simply saying that uh, if you don't count the cost, you know, the, we read about the embassy of I mean, sending, um, making peace with um, a man that is going to war or a king that is going to war and um, you're going to war with a king who has more um, amorate than you, that you would go and um, make peace so that you don't start something you can't finish. So what is it saying? It's saying that if you don't count the cost, the enemy will touch or manipulate your family your, those things that Jesus listed, your family, your brothers, your sisters, your spouse, your children, your properties, whatsoever, whatever you love or have put above the Lord, anything that you've not, um, that you've not deprioritized, anything that you, you love more than the Lord leaves you open for manipulation by the enemy. It says that um, whatever you love or whatever you put above the Lord Anything that you love or put above the Lord is open to manipulation, is open to be touched by the devil, and you will run away from the battlefield and abandon the Lord's call. So if you're such a person that the Lord has called you, but you are, and we all start that way, don't get me wrong, we, it's a process, we all start that way, but from time to time, God will begin to put his finger on certain things and says, okay, it's time to go deeper or higher in me, but for you to do so, you have to shed this weight. And if you refuse to shed that weight, it becomes a stumbling block for you or in your path when it comes to following the Lord. The enemy will constantly touch that thing. Anytime the enemy wants to pull you away from the Lord, it will touch that thing. If it's a business, the enemy knows that anytime you're about to go deeper in the Lord, all he has to do, because those things have the reins of your heart, all he has to do is touch those things or touch those relationships and you'll abandon the Lord and turn back and hold on to those things. I hope I'm making sense. We have a good example, the rich young ruler. Mark chapter 10, Mark chapter 10, verse 17 to 22. The rich young ruler he says, Now, as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? This man really wanted eternal life. So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. Verse 19, you know the commandments do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And actually pause he says this is jesus this is the lord's commandments god's commandments he's saying honor your father and your mother but this commandment still comes beneath the lord it is not above the lord you honor god first and then your father and your mother not the other way around so verse 20 says, and he answered and said to him teacher all these things i have kept for my youth then jesus Pay attention here, 21. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him. Note, Jesus loved this man. And then he said to him, one thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. 
what was Jesus saying here? It says, love that Jesus looking at him, loved him, and then said to him, deprioritize your wealth, deprioritize your possession, get rid of it. In fact, get rid of it fully. Love me more than you love those things. And to show that you love me more, get rid of those things. Let them go. It says, and come, take up the cross and follow me. Since you want eternal life, I'm the one that have eternal life. So to have it, you have to follow me. And to follow me, you have to remove this stumbling block, your treasure, your, your wealth. Get rid of it and then come. Verse 20 says, but he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful. Why? For he had great possessions. Oh, in fact, this man didn't quite have the possessions. The possessions had him. And this is, this is a classic example of what it looks like when we don't count the cost. This man wanted eternal life, but he didn't count the cost. He didn't realize that it will cost him deprioritizing his wealth. And by deprioritizing, literally getting rid of it. And we'll go deeper into it because it seems like, but you, when you read this story, you think, God, you simply don't, you don't love this man. But no. Thank God that scripture states clearly in verse 21 that Jesus looking at him loved him. So what kind of love is this that seeks to reduce you? Quote, unquote, seemingly, seems to seemingly redu reduce you. And it, it, that's because what he wants to give you is of far greater worth than what you seem to be losing. And that is, I think, what makes us afraid of um, of making sacrifices for the lord we th we think that we're we're gonna run at a loss right we think that it's to our own detriment now it may appear so but it is not so so let's continue so this like this rich young ruler anything like i said earlier anything you don't give up anything you don't surrender to god is a potential pressure point listen carefully Anything, relationship, your children, your husband, your wife, your, your business, your career, your ministry, your reputation, your gifts, your talents, anything you have not surrendered to God is a potential pressure point, weak point, or open door, or opportunity for temptation for the enemy to use to gain access to your heart and manipulate your feelings or use to turn you away from following the Lord just like this rich young ruler. His wealth was his weak point. What is yours? What is that thing that you are afraid to surrender? What is that thing that is pulling on your heartstrings that all the devil has to do is touch it and you drop, ev you drop everything that has to do with the Lord and you're running? What is that thing? And we all have it. We all have it. So this mission, this message is not to, to condemn anybody or to call anybody out. It's, it's, it's to cleanse us and to help deliver us and put us in that position where God wants us to be. It's to help us lay down these things. You know, um, Mark 10 verse 24 says, but Jesus answered and said to them, children, how hard it is. This was after the disciples witnessed what happened, Jesus' response to the rich young ruler. And I thought, and he thought, oh my God, and Jesus said, oh, it's impossible for a man that has riches to enter the kingdom. And they said, what? What do you mean? And Jesus rephrased it and said in, in verse 24 of Mark 10, he said, but Jesus answered again and said to them, children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches, those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. Emphasis on the word trust. So it's not that God doesn't want us to have riches. It's not that God doesn't want us to have our parents. It doesn't that it's not that God doesn't want us to have our children, our spouses, or our ministries, or our, our um, material possessions. No, that's not it. Not that He doesn't want us to have them. He wants. These are the blessings of the Lord. Remember, He said, "Seek first the kingdom, and all these things shall be added to you." God wants to add things. Remember, the Bible says that he richly gives us all things to enjoy. Remember that part when we, we talked about the nature of the will of God, that the will of God is good. The will of God is good. So whatever he's calling you to is good. It's not a life of lack or, de or deprivation. No, it is in his love. Um, he wants to bless you. But it says, if you trust in this quote and unquote riches, these things or these relationships or these possessions, then it is hard for you to, to enter the kingdom of God. You cannot follow him into the kingdom. 
You cannot apprehend eternal life like you ought to. So the key word is trust, trusting, trusting in. Um, Luke 9, 62, Jesus says, but Jesus said to him, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. This was a man that Jesus called to follow him. And he said, oh, let me go and, and do so and so. And Jesus said, no, no, no. If you, I can see that your heart, you, you're still putting your trust in whatever it is you're running to take care of. Then he said, nah, you're not fit. Because the enemy will come and he'll find something in you. The enemy will come and pull on your heartstrings. As you're following me, when I want to take you, when I want to take you somewhere deeper, somewhere higher, something greater, the enemy knows the button to press in your life. To make you turn over, to make you drop everything and run off, run off to where your heart is. And the Bible says, where your treasure lies, where your heart is, there your treasure lies. You know, so anything we do not give up, anything we do not lay down, anything we do not surrender to the Lord remains a pressure point, something that the enemy can use or touch to make you. Um, turn away from following the Lord, right? I want us to look at another example, the temptation of Jesus in um, John, on Matthew 4, verse 4. Matthew 4, the temptation of Jesus. The Bible said that then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now, Jesus too was not exempt from this, this um, situation. Because Jesus too had to pass this test, in quote and unquote. It says it was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to tempt the devil, to be tempted of the devil. And when he had um, fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, if you are the son of God, command these stones, um, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you and in their hands, they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against the stone. But Jesus answered, said, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Verse eight, this is where I'm going. Again, the third temptation, the, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory, those things that we all want. Verse nine says, and he said to him, all these things, I will give you. I will give you these things if you, if you will fall down and worship me. What did Jesus say? Verse 10. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. See, this is what it is like. Jesus had surrendered his desire for all these things. He had surrendered them because if he hadn't, the devil would have found a ground, he would have been able to pull his heartstrings. He was like, no. So Satan was like, look, look at what I can give you. All you need to do is just bow to me. But Jesus understood that. <laughs> Don't worry, I have died. I've surrendered that, that area. So you can't get me. The enemy could not pull Jesus' heartstrings away from following God because the will of God was for Jesus to die so that he can restore all that Adam, Adam lost. So the devil was offering Jesus an easy way out that you can do these things without making that sacrifice. You can do these things without, don't, don't go and make, don't go and, carry your cross. Don't go and make the sacrifice. I'll give it to you without. But know that if the devil gave this to Jesus and Jesus accepted this, this, then the devil remained the boss of Jesus. He would remain the boss of Jesus, wouldn't he? But Jesus knew that, no, no, no. <laughs> I, know your, I know that game, Satan. I'm not going to fall for that. He said that, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only, number one. He's number one. You can't, I, the, the, the glory of this world, the material possessions, the high mountains, whatever it is, the kingdoms of this world compare not to what God um, has for me. So Satan, you failed. And the enemy could not find a hold on Jesus there. 
verse um John 14 verse 30 says um is when um how did he put it now Jesus said the prince of this world has come but he finds nothing he's found nothing in me that means if you and there was no inroad there was no foothold that the enemy could could find if Jesus had not given up or surrendered and trusted all these things or areas to God, there would have been potential pressure points, weak points, open doors or footholds for of temptation for the enemy to use to gain access into Jesus's heart or to manipulate Jesus, his feelings or his emotions away and turn him away from the will of God. So what is it that you are struggling to give up? What hold does the enemy, what areas of your life do you know that right now, should the Lord appear and say, follow me in this path. The moment the enemy shows up and puts his finger on that thing, you're nah, that's it. You're like, God, sorry, I cannot follow you because I have this. I have this business because I have this um, relationship. I have my parents, um, um, their desire for me, plans for me. I have my plans or I have this um, fiance or this, this, you know, or spouse or children, what is it that is pulling on your heartstrings, pulling your heartstrings away from where the Lord is leading? What is that thing? I want you to ask yourself. And to help you, um, to help us understand better, because an area of struggle for us is this, this being a living sacrifice is an area of struggle for many of us. But that's because we think that we're going to be at a loss that it's going to be to our detriment when we give up these things, but no, because how can God ask you to, you know, give up your husband or um, that you should quote and unquote hate or love less your husband, your children, your career, your everything you've worked for, everything you, your sweat, your passions, everything you love. Why would he say you should lay them down in honor of him? Is he trying to hurt us? No, he's not. We know he loves us. but. As long as we see these things as, or how should I put it? Okay, understand this. What you're going to gain is, you may not see it, but what you're going to gain is of far greater worth than what you're losing. Because when you look at father, mother, wife, all those things that Jesus said, children, you don't literally, is it that God wants you to lose them, cut them off? No, that's not what he's saying. What he's saying is, Trust me with them. Give them over to me. Rather than you trying to take care of them such that they are now um, a hindrance to you following me, give them to me. Let me take care of them. Let me handle them. Let me keep them for you. That's what he's saying. Deprioritize them, not um, ignoring them, not, uh, not hating them, literally hating or despising them no he's just saying love me first and love them less by giving them to me so if you love the lord and you put your family in the lord your business your career your children in the you commit them into his hands then they are safe they are in the hands of the one that you have loved first that you have put first so it's not a loss he's keeping them for you they're in his hands all he's saying is trust me with them don't let them have control or that hold over you, over your affections above me. Put me first and then put all these things that you desire, that you own, put them in my hands. That's all. And trust me with them. That's all God is asking. So when we, when we think about the cost, um, don't think about loss. Naturally, yes, that it means loss, but don't see it that way. See it as you are taking them and putting them in the hands of the Lord. You're, you're um, relinquishing control over those things and entrusting them into God's hands. That's why we, we, um, the, we treated the topic of the will of God, the nature of the will of God, so that you understand that God's will is good. God's will for you is good. It's perfect. It's acceptable. Is not just to, out to destroy you. His plans for you are good and not evil. Plans to give you a hope and a future, to bring you to an expected end. So his, his plans for you are not to your detriment. They are to your advantage. So when God is saying, count the cost, he's saying, 
the cost is that you're going to have to do without these things um, first or for a season by prioritizing my requests, my needs first above them. And he's not saying get rid of them, punish them, cut them off. No, that's not what the Lord is saying. He loves them too. He wants, he wants you to have your family. He wants you to have your parents, enjoy your children, enjoy your, your business, your spouse, your everything. But he's saying that thing that you're enjoying, it's in a corrupted state. So I want to give you something better. I'm going to give you those things back, but you have to trust me with them first. It will look like you're losing them first you're not quite losing them you're going to gain them back in a better state that is all that's what he's saying and there's this scripture that says i don't have it here he that seeks to keep his life you lose it in the end See, that's what we don't understand we we hold on to these things saying lord i don't want to give them up lord i don't i can't trust you and god is like you're destined to lose them in fact you already lost them but to actually save them Give them to me. Trust me with them. And that is the only way you can keep them. That is the only way they will continue with you. That's the only way you can enjoy them. Because the blessings of the Lord make rich and add no sorrows with it. God does he wants you to enjoy your children. He wants you to enjoy your business. Enjoy your career without toil. That's what he wants. But he's saying, trust me first. Let me, put, let me take you through a conversion. Nail it to the cross. Let it die. You die to it and trust me to raise it up. Like Jesus, the Bible said that Jesus died to himself. I mean, Jesus laid down his life, but he took it up again. That's God's process. There's first a death before a resurrection. And resurrection doesn't, is not, when God resurrects something, it's never in the same state that he died. So what do you love? What is that thing that you're clinging to? That you're struggling to let go? Look at that thing. It's in a dead state. You may not see it, but it is death. But God is saying, give it to me. Put it in my hands. I want to breathe life onto it and give it back to you. That is all he's asking for. So when we're saying the cost of being a living sacrifice, it's not a sad story. It may seem like a sad story for a while. Remember, Jesus too, he kept telling his disciples um, that, you know, they're going to crucify me and I'm going to die. and on the third day, I'll rise again. But all they could hear was the crucifixion part. All they could hear was the death part. They were not hearing the life, the life. So when we're speaking of the cost of being a living sacrifice, don't just hear the death part. Don't just hear the sacrifice part. Hear the resurrection part. That's what I'm trying to give you so that when you understand that, it's easier to let go. It's easier to sacrifice. When you understand that you're going to get whatever it is you give up, my God, by God's grace, maybe next week or be next the next time or the next um or next two times, whenever we're going to talk about the rewards, the rewards. But today I'm focusing on the cost. But just to give you a slight preview, so the enemy doesn't steal this word in your heart, so you can understand God's heart. Is I want to bless you. I'm not trying to rob you. I'm not trying to deplete you. I'm trying to increase you. I'm trying to multiply you. But there's before that, before multiplication comes division, before life comes death, before resurrection comes crucifixion, before honor comes dishonor, before glory comes shame. So it may seem so this this message is to let you know the shame the dishonor the 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 crucifixion the cross part of it but you have to understand that the end of it is glorious so when you have that understanding you're quick to release whatever it is relationships children husbands wives business um your career whatever it is you're free to release it and it is by grace and the grace comes when you understand resurrection when you understand the end when you understand the reward so what is god really asking you to give up what is, what is he asking you to do he's simply asking you to trust him with those things you love trust him to take care of them for you while you put him first simple that is all god is asking so that those things will not have control over you they will not, um, the enemy will not use them. There will not be grounds for Satan to keep pulling you away from the Lord. Just give them over to the Lord. So when Satan comes and says, ah, what about 
your ministry? What about your wealth? What about your business? What about your career? I say it's in the hands of the Lord. I can follow the Lord wherever he wants me to go because he will take care of it. Shut up, Satan. God is taking care of it. Then Satan will keep quiet. Praise the Lord. I have a list of people here, biblical examples of people who gave up things to follow the Lord. I have a, a, quite a long list. I may not be able to go through all of them, but or I may not even be able to proceed into them, but I'll just give a rough, uh, I'll just mention a few. We have Abraham, we have Moses, we have um, Elisha, we have Ruth. So don't feel like you're the only person God is asking to give up, to give up things. We have the disciples, even Jesus himself ended up giving his life. We have Mary and Joseph. We have John the Baptist, Amos, the Levites, Jesus, like I said, and even many people and some of you on the platform have already given your lives. But I just want to emphasize today, you know, um, perhaps next time we'll continue into these individual examples. But I want you to, as I begin to round up, I want you to search yourself and ask yourself these questions. That what is it that um, the Lord is putting his finger on or has been putting his finger on all these years or all these months or all these days for you to surrender to him? What is that thing that is so costly for you to give up? What is it? What relationships? What businesses? In fact, what um, some of the things also include reputation. We're concerned about the way we're going to look before people when we surrender certain things. You know, there's a certain level of uncertainty about what will happen when we surrender these things to God. What will it look like? And if you're not, if you don't also trust God in the, with the unknown, it will be a stumbling block. You'll not be able to give what it takes. You'll not be able to surrender. So an, another area that we have to learn to surrender is the unknown. The unknown, the, 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 the Bible says about Jesus that he spent three days um, in the grave and he entrusted himself to God to raise him up. If God did not raise Jesus up, Jesus would have remained dead. But Jesus trusted God with his life. And that's what God wants, wants you to do. Trust me with that, your future, with your known future. Trust me. Trust me with your reputation. Yes. Counting the cost, when we, when we talk about um, the cost of being a living sacrifice, it involves, um, it involves self-denial. It involves sacrifices, clearly. It involves doing the will of God and not your will. It involves sometimes hurt. It will hurt. It will hurt your flesh. You will feel pain. Let me not deceive you. You will feel pain when you give up certain things. It's, it can be embarrassing. It involves shame. Jesus hung on the cross. Why? Because that was what um, the father wanted. In fact, the father chose the death that he would die. He said, no, this I want you to die in this manner on the cross. And to the Jewish mind, dying on the cross is a shameful thing. That means you're dying the death of a, of a criminal. So God even wants us to trust him, even with that kind of decision, that kind of <laughs> arrangement. But Jesus said, okay, Lord, I, I trust you. Okay, how do you want me to die? Oh, on the cross. Oh, that's a shameful death, Lord. But okay. And Jesus hung there, naked, apparently. What we see in the movies was even being modest. Apparently was hung naked for all to see. This is the Lord Jesus, the one who created heaven and the earth. God incarnate, God in human body. He despised the shame, Hebrews 12 says. He endured the cross and despised the shame. So part of the cost is that it will, it will cost you your reputation. It will cost you your glory. You look bad. You look embarrassing to yourself and the people around you. Potentially, not necessarily all the time, but what God is calling you to do when you lay down, when you make those sacrifices, you could look that way. It involves waiting. So while you wait for God to rec for God to resurrect you or restore that thing that you're trusting Him with, you have to trust Him and wait for Him to do it in His time. 
So it involves you being patient. It involves seeming loss of time, like time is being wasted when you're um, counting the cost of following the Lord. It's part of the cost. It looks like you are losing time when others are running ahead of you. And you seem to be standing still. Your life seems to be stagnant or slow. That's part of the cost. So it's good that you know these things so that when they begin to happen, the enemy doesn't use them to pull, to pull your heartstrings and say, oh, do you know it's taking time? You're like, yes, I knew that. I've counted the cost. Oh, do you know this is making you look bad? Yes, I know that. I knew that was going to happen. I've counted the cost. Do you know that this means you're not going to have your way? Like, yes, I know. I've counted the cost. I'm on the track. I'm not turning back. Do you know this is hurting? Do you know this is going to hurt you more? Yes, I know. I've counted the cost. I'm not turning back. Try. What else do you have, Satan? What else do you have? Do you know you're going to lose friends? Yes, I know. I've counted the cost. This is more important to me than the friends. And by the way, I have the promise that you'll resurrect my friendships. You'll resurrect my, my relationships. Yes, I know, Satan. I'm on track. I'm not turning back. Do you know you're going older? Yes, Satan, I know. It's part of the deal. I've counted the cost. I'm not turning back. Do you know you may be poor for a while? And Satan is like, yeah, I know. I've counted the cost. Are you, you're saying to Satan, yes, I've counted the cost. The Lord shall supply all my needs according to his riches in glory. Whatever I need, I'm going to get it. I may not have more than enough for that phase, but God has got me and is going to restore me. I'm not going to be here forever. And even if I'm here forever, as long as he's glorified, that's what matters. When you have that attitude, when you have that mind, Satan has nothing on you. Do you know that this looks like God has forsaken you? You say, yeah, I know. That's how it looked for Jesus on the cross too. Even Jesus said, oh, Eloi, Eloi, Sabak, uh, how did he, what was he? He said, <laughs> he said oh, uh, my father, why have you forsaken me? It looks like, you know, he, Jesus looked completely, utterly forsaken on the cross. In fact, he was forsaken because of the sins that he bore, our sins that he bought on, on himself, the sin of the world. It was part of the deal. Imagine if Jesus on the cross was so mindful of being embarrassed. He would have crawled off that cross. He had the power to, he would have left that cross. But he had counted the cause that, yeah, shame is part of the deal. Nakedness is part of the deal. Loss of reputation. Because they said, oh, is this not the one that healed everybody? Is this not the one that, is this not the one? And look at him hanging there so shamefully. Jesus was like, yep, I knew that. I've counted the cost. I'm not turning back. I'm not coming down from this cross. I'm looking ahead to the resurrection. That's the cost. I've counted the cost. Do you know? Do you know you're going to lose your followers? You're going to lose disciples? You just say, yeah, I know. I've counted the cost. Following the Father is, having the Father is more important to me than having everybody else. In fact, Jesus lost his, father, his, his siblings at some point because when they came to, to him, he said, they said, your father and your brothers are seeking you. He said, these are my, are my, my, my brothers and my mother. He said, these are my mother and my brothers, those who hear the word of God and do the word of God. Whoa. Jesus said, yeah, I've counted the cost. <laughs> Even family. I'm not, there's, I'm taking no prisoners. Everybody is going. God remains. And all for Jesus, only, you know, he, he stood naked on that cross but he despised that shame you know so what is it is it time that is making you um is it the time the, the fact that you're getting older the fact that you may suffer loss you may look poor for a while you may look naked for a while you may you may look as if god god is not with you god is not for you you may look disfavored for a while is that a bother to you? Have you counted that cost as well? Have you factored that in when it comes to being a disciple of Jesus? So anyway, as I round up, I just want to um, encourage you. This, this, I want you to, wherever you are, I want you to pray. Speak to the Lord, however this message has touched you. If there is one area of your life that has been remained untouchable to God, your reputation, your comfort, whatever it is, Say, Lord, I surrender it today. I ask for grace. 
And if you surrender it, and if you're struggling, ask for grace. Receive grace, rather, because his grace is abundant towards you. So receive, receive the grace. There's no question of God not giving you the grace. It's available. You just need to receive it. Grace to lay down anything that is pulling on your heartstrings that you have put above the Lord. Anything that dictates how you live your life apart from the Lord. This is the time. There's grace now. Receive grace to surrender it. And even if you're still not willing, say, Lord, make me willing. Philippians um, 2.13 talks about how God works in us. He's a work in us both to will and to do, to desire and to act for his good pleasure. So if you don't have that desire to count the cost or to lay down things, ask God for help with the desire. He wants to help with that as well. Say, Lord, I surrender my heart, I surrender my desires to you. You walk on my desire. Make me willing to do your will. Make me willing to let this thing down, to let to lay this thing down. Is it a habit? Is it a desire, a hobby, a pastime, or something that is occupying your time that makes you not have time for the Lord? Something that has your heart that is not making your heart open to God anymore. Lay it down, receive grace, and ultimately trust God. Trust him. Say, Lord, I trust you. Lord, I trust you with my life. Lord, I trust you with my business. I trust you with my career. I trust you with my children. I trust you with my husband. I trust you with my wife. I trust you with my ministry. I trust you with my reputation. Lord, we trust you this evening, this afternoon, Lord. We lay everything down again at your feet. We receive grace grace to keep following you grace to keep laying aside every weight and the sin that so easily causes us to to be hindered to stumble in our discipleship walk oh god in following you wherever you want us to go lord we receive grace this afternoon lord and we thank you lord for enabling us to lay these things down Thank you that our reputation we nail it to the cross thank you for the grace to nail our comfort our comfort, our parents, the demands, the glories and desires for things, the final things of life. Father, we lay them down in honor of you. Lord, thank you for abundant grace this afternoon. Thank you for grace. Thank you for testimonies of laying things down, of paying the price, of counting the cost, oh God, in response to this message that you have sent today, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen and amen.